way to wow. I am so excited. Stop, stop, stop. Hold on. We got to record. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, hold on. And? Good afternoon, and welcome to the Way to Wow show, where I, Leah Siegel, bring you incredible speakers that are professionals in their field to give you content and value in how to be prepared financially in every situation. Thank you to my producer, Rabbi Kevin Bemmel. And I wanna just give a little, um, give you some uh, ideas of why do I have this thing on my head? Why am I having a pink hair? I did not accidentally put the wrong color dye. I did not decide to go pink, even though I think about it from time to time. But today is a special holiday. It's called Purim. And it's a day in which we reflect on the miracle where we were once going to be destroyed, but miracles happen. And in the last minute, lives are saved. Things are turned around upside down beyond comprehension. And it's a day where we dress up, we give gifts to each other and we celebrate. And it's a special holiday to, for me. Um, not only is it my birthday week, it's always been my favorite holiday. Um, the idea of dressing up, it's not just about being in disguise. It's about you get to choose who do you want to be, right? Dreaming big. And also remembering that at any moment when you feel despair and you feel hopeless, it's not over yet. There's a chance for things to be turned around. And I know that in this time, Jewish people got together. They came together as a nation. They prayed and they fasted. And they were actually able to turn around the fate and Queen Esther save the day. And it's, it's a very meaningful day. I, I, I will encourage people to look it up and connect with something in there. And so that's why I've got the wig. I feel I want to bring Purim to you guys so that you could feel the joy that I feel with my family today. I'm actually in a new location. I'm in San Diego visiting family. And I want to give a little recap on last week's show before we dive into today's show. Last week, we had a chance to have Dina Michael, CEO of Impact Leadership Network, and we had a great conversation about women empowerment, women in leadership, success principles, what it's like to be a business owner coming out of that employee mindset mentality, and to really give people valuable information that they can use every day to make quick changes to get ahead financially, save better, um, not procrastinate like most people tend to do. And so if you did not have a chance to join us last week, please go to our YouTube channel, The Way to Wow, and check it out with Dina Michael. And today I bring to you someone who I learned so much from, who I know personally has helped a lot of people uh, that I work with and clients of mine. And her name is Brenda Kramer. Her specialty is helping you understand your student loans and what your options are. And you're gonna learn a lot, I would say, grab a pen. If you know someone who has student loans, you're gonna to wanna to tell them about today. You're gonna to wanna to send them this clip and you're, or point them in this direction. There's so much that we could learn and you, we're gonna dive right in. And I want to introduce you, Brenda. Thank you so much for taking the time on a Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. You could be having lunch with a girlfriend. You could be strolling <laughs> the beaches, uh, but you're here with us today. So thank you. And I wanted to just, I guess we'll start introducing you you introduce yourself tell us how did you know that you this is what you want to do help people figure out their student loans what is so special about this topic that excited you to get involved well first off thank you so much for having me and my story is one that fits really well with putting your finances in order and understanding your finances so many years ago, I was married. I was a stay-at-home mother and had never worked. And my son was in college and my husband passed away suddenly. And he had done zero to prepare because he passed away so young. And so I was faced with finding a way to keep my son in college. So the financial advisor at the school said, oh, here, you can take out these loans. We can take out these in your son's name and these in your name, and you don't have to worry. Everything's paid for. Nobody explained to me that after my son left school, what was going to happen with those loans? So approximately 10 years later, as I'm starting to rebuild my life, the government takes my tax return. And I went, what happened? I called the IRS and found out that 
those student loans were not my son's responsibility. They were mine. So they had never been paid on. They went into default. And since I had moved because I lost my home, I had no idea. So I found a gentleman who helped me with the process of putting my loans back into good standing with the Department of Education and getting me on an affordable payment plan so that it didn't reoccur. And I was, you know, as the years went by and I decided I wanted to retire, I moved to Nevada and retired and realized retirement at my age, I was only in my fifties, just really wasn't working for me. So I went to work for him and he trained me on everything about student loans. And I work with financial advisors through this process because I have such a passion for everybody, women, men, to have a financial plan that protects themselves and their family, because I did not have that. And so I learned through this whole process that you can take the funds that you're paying on student loans in, and most of its interest and redirect those funds into building and creating your wealth and your retirement. And I've worked with so many people from doctors all the way down to single mothers who are cashiers at the convenience store find a better way to manage the repayment of their loans. And that's why I have such a passion for it because it was it's such a deeply personal subject for me. I don't want anybody to find themselves in their 50s still not having the ability to retire because they have things like their student loans and they haven't been able to invest. And now they find themselves, well, what do I do? And I help with, in partnership with their financial advisors to find those answers. Wow, Brenda, this is amazing. And you know, a lot of people, their whole lives they're questioning, what's my purpose? What am I gonna do? And sometimes it's that harshness and that rock bottom that hits us that causes us to find what it is that we can do to make a difference. And you're doing that. You're doing that every day. I'm sure you know, you wish it didn't happen that way right. and that you found it another way. But at the same time, you now can feel what other people can possibly go through. And you're helping so many people through your story. So thank you for sharing that. It's, and, and I'm so sorry for your loss. And you are an incredible mom raising, you know, children on your own. And it's not, it's not an easy thing. And I'm sure there were other parts of your life aside from student loans that you wish were taken care of. And it's for another time, but right, this is exactly. a, a really powerful statement that you said. And so thank you for that. And I, I have so many questions and I also have a list of questions that other people wanted me to ask you, but we're going to do one thing at a time. Okay. Number one, people say, oh, I don't need anyone to help me. I'll figure this out on my own. So tell me your thoughts on, can I do this by myself? So it is difficult for some people to want to pay for another's expertise. So I like to compare what I do as an accountant is, or h &R Block is to your tax return. Everybody can do their own taxes, right? However, if you employ an expert, then it's their job to take your information and present it to the IRS and pr to prepare that paperwork so that you pay the least amount in taxes or you get the highest refund. So a lot of people do, they fill out their own tax return and that's great. If it's a very simple situation, I, I applaud anybody. However, the reason that accountants exist to help with the IRS is because it is such a convoluted and complicated process. And it takes a tremendous amount of knowledge to understand all the different rules and regulations. And it's the same thing with the Department of Education. The government does not give away anything for free easily, right? So they make you jump through a lot of hoops in order to get that lower payment. 
The other thing is with the Department of Education, you're not dealing directly with the Department of Education, you're dealing with one of their servicers. So a servicer is the company that manages the loan payments and questions from the borrowers for the Department of Education. So when you're speaking to your servicer, you're speaking to a private company individual. Now, some of them are commissioned based on the amount that they collect from you. So now you're dealing with a double layer. You're dealing with the servicer who may not have all the knowledge and understanding of how the student loan programs work versus directly with the Department of Education. And you're also dealing with a salesperson. I'll give you a very quick example of how the servicers look for their own interests as opposed to the borrowers. I have a client, she was just graduating from college and she called the servicer to discuss how to set up her payment plan and make her payments. And they were explaining to her that she had accrued interest during the time she was in school. And if she wanted to lower her payment, she could make a lump sum payment on her loans before they were even due. So he convinced her to take her $4,000 graduation gift from her parents and pay it on her student loans. Now, number one, she was eligible for a 10-year forgiveness plan, right? And so we were able to go back and get that money refunded to her. Wow. And then put her into the plan where her payment was maybe $10 a month to start. And she was going to get 10 year forgiveness. So this was the servicer that did this. Another story, which amazes me, and this is during the pandemic. There's a teacher at Yavna Day School. In, I used it's, to teach there. Did you know that? Okay. Well, this was, this is in, <laughs> um, I can't remember. I think she's in Philadelphia or Boston okay, somewhere. A in the, yeah, there's a Yavna in Cleveland too. Okay. So they convinced this woman who'd been paying on her loans for 20 years, and they were loans that she had taken out for her child's education, to give them $30,000. Okay. Wow. Under this plan, her loans were eligible for immediate forgiveness. She didn't owe them any more money. And they conned her out of 30, in my opinion, it was a con. Okay, let me preface that. Um, but they talked her into making this $30,000 payment. And what we did was we got her 30,000 back and we got her loans immediately discharged. So how did she find you? I mean, because she had already she found she did me. her thing. How did she know she needed to continue the search? So her son was friends with a team member of Elevated. I think it's Elevated, Jeremy Sherrill. Yes. So who's okay. And this was an accountant that had met him at a networking event. Wow. Years later, and this was years later he reached out to me and we were able to correct what I considered to be just an atrocity to this, for this woman. I mean, she's in her seventies and they, they took 30,000 from her. We got it back. Brenda, I mean, and that's enough right, probably to keep her alive for a year. I'll tell you something. You are a miracle worker and think, God, <laughs> we are out and about and talking to people. Jeremy is actually one of my partners. And it's so important to have these conversations. Just a simple question. Do you know anyone who has student loan debt or any stories to share around the stress of student loan debt and where it can lead to? Uh, no joke. There are people that make 30000 a year and, and she had to give that up. Unreal. unreal. Well, I'm, I, I like happy endings. So thank you for sharing those two stories. Um, a lot of people have questions like, 
how will this affect my credit? Does it affect my credit in a neg negative impact? No. So student loans are a need-based loan. And what that means is they are not given or repaid based on your credit. Yes, the Department of Education servicers report to the credit bureaus things like late payments. But when you're paying back your loans or you're taking out your loans, they don't have any effect on your credit score. A large student loan can be an issue on your debt to income when trying to obtain other financing. But again, we've got solutions for people in these programs that when they go to take out a mortgage, if there's issues because of their student loans, we have some options that can help to get them improved and even get a higher mortgage if they so choose. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're, everything is tied together. You know, there's a financial picture, right, mm -hmm. that we take of people on their debt to earned income ratio is a big factor when it comes to, you know, being able to get all the other things they want in life and people believing that they can afford it, you know, having the trust of a, of a creditor. How does one know if their loans are federal? I, I sit with people and they say, well, I don't know if it's federal. I don't know if it's private. Is there something easy that you can tell us? So there is a website called studentaid.gov and all federal loans are stored on that website. So if you went to FAFSA, um, to take out the loans, then they're federal. If you went to a bank, then more than likely they're private. But this is where you can check to make sure they're federal. Right now, all federal loans are on hold because of COVID, private or not. There are some federal loans that are not covered under the CARES Act. So we can always go and log into studentaid.gov and if the loans are there, they're federal. If they're not, they're private. Okay. Tell us in a nutshell about uh, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Like if someone says, well, what is that? Okay. So the big picture is income-driven repayment plans where your payment is based on your income. A sub-program of that is the forgiveness program. So if you work for a nonprofit or a government entity, city, county, state, federal, you have to make 120 payments and you can apply for forgiveness. If you work for a private company or you're self-employed, it's between 20 and 25 years. So a qualifying payment is the key here. Every payment you make while working for a nonprofit or the government counts towards the 120 credits when you can apply for forgiveness. So it does not matter if you are the janitor or if you are the CEO of the organization. It's who the employer is, not the occupation. And that's what confuses people. They think you have to be a nurse or a teacher or a police officer, and that's not true. I just enrolled the night janitor, or custodian, I apologize, at a school district into the program because she qualified for public service. And she didn't think she did because she wasn't a teacher. But yes, it's the employer, not the occupation. That's really important to know because there's so many roles that help make an organization run smoothly. And if mm -hmm. anyone's employed there, regardless of what their title is, right. and they happen to have the need for the student loans. And, and there are a lot of questions regarding the differences between repayment and forgiveness programs, right? What are the different options when it comes to repayment? So the Department of Education offers everybody that is in school when they leave, whether they leave before they've graduated or after graduation, everybody is put on a standard 10-year repayment plan. So I use an average of 50,000 because that's really what an average bachelor's costs. 
So if you graduate with 50,000 in debt, your payment will be approximately $500 a month for 10 years or 120 payments. And at the end, you've paid 60,000 and your loans are finished. They also offer an extended fixed. So that's where they lower your payment by about 60%. So a $500 payment would be 200, but you have that loan now for 25 years. And having a loan for 25 years and consistently making payments is a very difficult thing because life happens. But if by a miracle you were able to do that, you would pay the same 60. Then there's the income-driven repayment plan. So if you have somebody that has 50,000 in debt and they're married with two children, it brings their payment to approximately $80 a month. And if all things stayed consistent and stable over a 20 year period, they would pay back about 20,000. And the 30,000 is forgiven? Mm -hmm. All of the remaining principal and any accrued interest is forgiven. Now, That's jumping amazing. back to public service, another benefit of that program is when your loans are forgiven, it is a tax-free forgiveness. If you are working for a private company or self-employed, as of right now, you will receive a 1099 for cancellation of debt upon that forgiveness. Right now, Biden's put a hold on taxes on forgiveness on certain programs. I personally think that it's setting a precedent. The first taxable forgiveness is not even available till 2027. So it's going to be an unknown whether or not they're going to hold everybody to those taxable consequences or not but we do tell everybody to prepare. And there's different ways to prepare for that. And the taxes on forgiveness are never going to be more than you would pay if you paid off the loan in full with the interest. Okay. There's a lot to know around all this. You know, it's not so simple. And there's a lot of factors and variables to find out which plan is best. Um, and Income is certainly a, one of the biggest factors here. I meet attorneys that have, you know, a quarter million in income and a half a million dollars in student loan debt. And, and it's been years and they haven't even made a dent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's definitely something that's a wake up call for people who are thinking about, well, what should I be doing? What should I be looking for when I'm applying for these loans? Right? We think we're going to get this windfall and just land an amazing job my first year out of school, right? And then <laughs> take care of all that. But there's also living expenses. There's so many other things aside from those student loans, right? People also wanted to know what happens if I get disabled, I pass away, does this debt automatically become my family's responsibility? No, under disability discharge, if you become disabled, whether it is your direct loan as the student or whether your parent took out the loan for you, the loans can be immediately discharged under 100% disability. If God forbid something happens to the student, the loans are discharged. If a parent took out a loan for their child's education and God forbid something happened to that child, the loans are discharged. If something happens to the parent, the loans are also discharged. Okay, and what if they stop going to school, right? Or the school closes down? So there's a program called Borrower's Defense to Repayment. And for those of you who remember Corinthian College in California or ITT Tech or Everest, there's a program where you can apply to have your loans forgiven because you felt you were defrauded. Wow. It's not an easy um, case to win. 
it's a limited amount of funding there and it takes years to actually get your case put through. I've seen some very successful cases. We had a woman that received um, $42,000 in refund on her payments and had the balance of the loan discharged. So it's a 25 year, I'm sorry, 25 page application. And we do help people with borrower's defense However, we also in conjunction will put them into the program so that if their case is lost, they're at least on that forgiveness program and they're still moving forward to forgiveness. I've seen it be successful. I've seen it a, a lot of denials. So right. we always go for it, but we never depend on it. Speaking of denials, you know, someone mentioned to me once, well, I've already been denied. What should I try again? Yes. Tell me more about that conversation. <laughs> so public service loan forgiveness, the first time that could be applied for was in 2017. 97% of the applications were denied because they were in the wrong program. Oh. They had the wrong type of loans. They didn't have all the documentation with the Department of Education. So on a very short-term basis, President Biden has put in a special program that ends October 31st, 2022, where if your loans were in the wrong program, if you, your loans were the wrong type of loans, or the most famous one is, the servicers consolidated your loans and you lost your credit and told you you had to start over. That program fixes all that. It allows you to reapply for the forgiveness and go back and get the credits that you should have been. So I probably, wow. I probably have eight people right now that we're working on who were denied originally and we're going back to, to get those, um, those loans forgiven. And I know we'll be successful. I'm 100% positive. I love it. that. But it's limited. It's yeah. only until October of 2022, unless, of course, again, he extends it, which he should. He should make it permanent. I mean, there's right. no, you hear people say all the time, right. Biden's going to forgive all the student loans. No, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. And I'll tell you why. This is a statistic that I can't um, tell you exactly where to go to verify it. However, student loan interest is the second largest income to the department or to the United States government, second only to foreign arms sales. Wow. So wow. the Department of Education earns, under normal circumstances, COVID is an exception, approximately $50 million a month in student loan interest. So 50 times 12 is $600 million. The government is not going to give up a half a billion in income. Especially now. That they're Especially sending out now so money. <laughs> and excuse all of those loans because how do you excuse the loan of the doctor who's making 400,000 versus the woman who had to quit working to stay home to take care of her children and has no income? Wow. So I don't believe for a second. Right, that that's going to happen. That that's going to happen because they have these programs in place. This is the option to getting your student loan managed. So I personally okay. don't think it's ever going to happen. And if you have 100000 in debt, 50000 in forgiveness is great, but you're still left with 50000 Right, and it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when is the right time? Is there a special time one should enter a program? Immediately. Is there a sweet spot? <laughs> Immediately. There is no reason. I'm sorry, but there is no reason to pay the government any interest if you don't have to. 
because student loans are front loaded on interest. And I have a philosophy, you should take your money to earn interest instead of pay interest. So there is no reason not to enter these programs immediately. If your circumstances change and it's no longer applicable, then that's fine. Then you start, you know, paying off the loan. But right. it's a safety net just in case. In case. And speaking of not being applicable anymore, I, I hear people say all the time, I'm not making money now or I'm not making what I want to earn now, but I know it's going to change in six months to a year. Mm -hmm. So do these change if it's, you know, they're looking at your income and they're right. looking to see what you qualify for. How often, and is it on the person who is in the program to report that they have an increase or a decrease in income? How does that work? So the, the requirement of the program is that you report to the Department of Education once a year on your income and your family size. If there's been a change, the Department of Education is going to adjust your payment up or down accordingly. Right now, just an FYI, most recertifications have been put on hold. So a lot of people who are supposed to recertify, it's been pushed out till 2023. Using the program as a safety net because you can report if your income de decreases, but you're not obligated to report if it increases. That's awesome. So if, if you lose your job, you can go to the Department of Education and say, I'm unemployed, and they take your payment to zero. If you get a job two months later, you don't have to tell them until your recertification date. It's just a loophole. Okay, that makes all. sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of pivot over to some six more success stories, and you're welcome to share if you have anything to show us. I know we talked about case studies and why are these important? What do you think happens, right, when you are meeting with someone? And I know on my, on my end, you know, I talk to people and they're like, I don't really save much because I have all this money going to my mortgage and I have money going to my car payment and I have money going to my student loans. And when I finish paying off my loans, and I'm trying to make these big payments to my mortgage, right? Right. And then I'm going to start saving for our, my retirement or my child's education. And so I know if we were able to free up some people's money, right, what would that look like? Imagine you mentioned, a, a, I think you said it was a $600 or an $800 a month payment being reduced to 200 Well, they're already used to throwing this $800 somewhere. Now we have this $500 we just found money, right? So talk to us about some things you wanna share, some, some success stories, some case studies. So first I wanna give you a, a statistic from the Department of Education. For every dollar of student loan debt, it equals $10 in lost retirement savings because you're waiting the 10 years to start retiring, right, to, to really, you know, focus on your retirement. So if you have a $50,000 loan, you're reducing your retirement fund by $500,000. It's one of the reasons the government created these programs. They recognized that people were so focused on student loans because of how aggressive the interest is. They're walking into retirement with significantly less money so now they're dependent on government resources, Social Security, Medicaid, and all these other things. And the government realized they're chasing their tail, right? So yeah. that's why these programs were instituted. So I'll give you an example. I have a woman who is a single mother. She's a doctor. She's in Seattle. And she makes about $78,000 a year. And she had about $150,000 in student loan debt. So they put her on something called a, an extended graduated program. So her payments were starting out very low, but over the 25 years, they were set to go to between two and $3,000 a month to pay off the loan. So her 150, 60,000, she was going to be paying back 
close to 375,000. She works for a nonprofit hospital, right? So we, we were able to get her payment down to $78, okay? And, as, and her, she's a researcher, so she's going to be staying at that hospital. So she's going to pay approximately $78 a month, not a 25-year loan, but a 10-year loan. Wow. So the amount that we saved her made the difference between her being able to, and I had, this is one of my calls where the agent was on. So she realized I only have a $78 payment. I can afford life insurance for my, to protect my child. I can get a real long-term disability policy. I can get a policy on my child. And that agent closed on three policies on that call that it was going to make all the difference in this woman's world in protecting her family. Wow. But don't, you know, let's not forget the government was happy to take it all from her. Right. Absolutely. I, those are, those are powerful right there. And if you're listening to this and you're saying to yourself, like, where do I go from here? Right. We're going to make sure that people can get a hold of you. Um, we'll have your information in the notes um, because this, uh, you don't, do you charge for people to have a, a phone call, a consultation with you? How does that work? Our consultations are 100% free and my consultations are not very salesy and, and Leah's been on calls with me. I yes. educate the people and the borrowers first on how does student loan debt and repayment plans really work. Most people do not realize that they are in the wrong program and will end up paying more over the term of the loan than in a different program. So yeah. I don't always, you know, not everybody it does this program work for, but what does work for everybody is the knowledge of how student loan repayment works. Because sometimes, and for some people, and I can't tell you how many, if they weren't able to pay their loans and they went in default, the government is taking their tax returns, they're garnishing their wages, they can't even feed their families. So when that happens, we can help get them out of that default, get them their tax returns for the next year, get the garnishment stopped so that they can buy groceries. And I had a crossing guard whose social security check from $834 was being garnished $152 for his student loans from 30 years ago. This man was a $10 an hour crossing guard and he just happened to be the crossing guard in front of our office. Wow. And we were able to help him. So the government there's just so much you can do with the money that goes to student loans. Sometimes, you know, it helps you invest. Sometimes it helps you take a vacation. But for some people, it's the difference about what food they put on their table. If your loans are in default and you are a federal employee, you will lose your job. If you are a federal employee that requires security clearance and your student loans are either in default or you are behind on the payments, you have a certain amount of time or you will be terminated. Wow. Okay. In some states, nurses will lose their licenses if their student loans are in default. The government is vicious with these things. Wow. I mean, I, my, my head is like circling, you know, what if someone enters a program and even then after entering a program can't pay, you know, what if I'm not working anymore? There's, there's so many things, but I know that um, we have some questions from people yeah. that are with us now, and mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have enough time to answer those. So I'm going to um, hand it over to Rabbi Kevin Bemo, my producer, who has some questions for you. Thanks, Leah. So, um, Brenda, first of all, you're presentation is 
eye-opening. I had no idea. You know, back in my day, I think there was one student loan program. And, you know, of course, I borrowed a whopping $8,000 to get my undergraduate degree. <laughs> it still took me <laughs> 10 years to pay it back. But, uh, you know, um, it's nothing like what people owe today. It's just a completely different world. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, can you give us an idea of how many different programs are there? Because it sounds like there's, you said there's a lot of confusion about people being in the wrong program. So how many different programs are there? So the standard programs that have nothing to do with income, there are three. There's standard, which is a 10-year program. There is an extended fixed, which is a fixed payment for 25 years. Or there's an extended graduated where your payment increases every two years until you pay that loan off. So your payment could start out at 400, but as it gets closer 20 years later, it could go to 3000. Then there's the income driven repayment plan and it's an umbrella. And under that umbrella, there's five different plans. There's, and it's, it's really based on your loans. There's um, repay, payee, IBR, um, ICR, and then there's one that's never used, it's for new borrowers. But all the income driven have the same two basic characteristics. Your payment is based on your income and forgiveness is given at the end as long as you meet the terms and conditions of any remaining principal and any interest that's accrued. So, so in other words, there's um, eight nominally, but seven different programs. And okay, so that, that I mean, that, that alone is, is a, I mean, it'd be like there's seven different, you know, income tax codes. Right, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. So second question is, um, when you were talking about um, people who are in um, government service, now, would that include people who go into the military? Yes. That, it does. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's great because a lot of people go into the military with with loans outstanding and the military doesn't always there are some programs where you join the military they'll pay your loans off but right. by not not everybody no. okay. um so the last question i had is you know you mentioned a couple examples where people had paid lump sums and had gotten them refunded so is there a time limit um, after which you can't go back and refund them? Or is it basically, you know, like if I made a lump sum 20 years ago, would, I, would you be able to go back and recapture that money for me? What is the time limit? If there is any? No, both of those situations was within 30 days. So oh. it was very, very quick that, you know, I think what happened is it woke them up you know, the, when the mother made a $30,000 withdrawal from her retirement fund, the son said, what did you just do? And, and came to me and we, they immediately jumped on it. The other was the same thing. The daughter told her parents that she spent her graduation gift to pay down her student loans. She was really proud of herself. And her mother went, no, and found us. So both of those instances, it was relatively quick. And, and is that go like back. 30 days is the deadline or? I, it's really hard to say. I just, I'm not a hundred percent positive. I just know both my situations was within 30 days. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the last thing I wanted, actually one more question came to mind. Last thing, so you mentioned the situation where um, you took out loans and your son took out loans, but in the end you were responsible for all of them. I know when I went to college, my parents had nothing to do with me getting the loans. I, I took them out. As far as I know, they had no responsibility for repaying those loans. I mean, I was the one who signed the papers and everything. How, how would a parent versus a, you know, a, a student know who is responsible for repaying their loans? So a direct loan is a loan that the student takes out through the Department of Education, and those are the student's responsibility. A parent plus loan is where the parent goes to the Department of Education or the FAFSA website, and the parent takes out the loans. Those loans, although they're for the child's education, are the parent's responsibility. Mm 
you cannot combine the child's loans and the parent's loans together. They will always stay separate. Okay. Okay. And, and if I could add in, and I'm not sure if this is a standard rule across the board, if the child is under 18, they need to have an adult over 18 sign on the loan. There is no something similar thing. like that happened to, to my child. Um, but then when she turned 18, we put the loans back in her name. Right. So if they were federal, what it is, is because she was under 18 as a minor, you're not allowed to sign those loans. So the parent will give approval for the child to take out the debt, but the debt is still the child. But if you oh. had taken out a parent plus loan, that can never be transferred to the child. There's a difference. And Brenda, this is the scary piece right here. Because before I was in this industry and, and talking to families and understanding money, I had no clue. Mm -hmm. I still, this is not my field of expertise, which is why I right. have you, the expert here. But I remember that I signed because my child was 17 at the time. And then when they turned 18, we moved it over. But I have no clue if it was a parent plus, but probably the way you're describing it was probably me giving permission. But right. people don't know. And there's not usually a conversation when you're sitting across the desk in the federal, in, in the aid, right? And there's no that. education. It's sign here, sign here, sign here. Um, how does, you know, so entering the programs that you have, we mentioned seven mm -hmm. or eight choices. How does one know what's best for me? Is that something that you decide based on hearing my story, hearing my, looking at my income, looking at my expenses, looking at my tax bracket, you then choose the best fit because that seems like there's a lot of variables. So just to kind of clarify, what I do is I, looking at the situation, the loans, the income, the family size, I will let the client know what the options available are and then we go over the long-term ramifications of those options. I make a recommendation, but the client ultimately will make the decision on what is best for them. Because I don't know, you know, student loan and debt's emotional. All debt is emotional. There are yeah. some people who no matter what, they want to pay those loans. And that's fine. And then I will go I over the different payment plans. So they pay the least amount of interest. If you come to me and you say, I'm never paying on these loans, I'm not giving them a dime. I'll say, thank you very much, but I can't help you because I can't guarantee that you took out the loans from the government. I can offer you the best options to pay the least, but I can't get anybody out of a student loan. I mean, unless it's a disability. But right. Leah, one thing that's really funny, most people don't know, is there can be a limit or a cap on the amount of federal student loan a student can take out. <laughs> the financial aid officers are at times paid commissions from private banks to promote private student loan debt, and the parent does not know that they're being pitched private debt above the federal. Right. So they can I walk tell, away having money in both places. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Wow. I, especially elderly people, because a grandmother can take out loans. I saw a grandmother stuck with $87,000 in private student loans. And she said, but I went to the school. We took these out at the school. But the financial aid officer actually also worked for Wells Fargo. So this woman is. I hear this eight. all the time. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful. Yeah. Brenda, is this true even at nonprofit universities? I can't. I I'm not 100 percent positive about that. I I'm really not. Wow. You know, it's uh just always do your due diligence. Ask questions. If you're taking out loans, you would not go out and buy a car without knowing what your interest rates were, what your payments were, how interest was, what happens if you pay off the loan, you'll ask a million questions, right? Well, but some people, people not. That's the scary part, Brenda. I oh. have met people that got <laughs> into cars and homes. They're looking at my monthly, their monthly payment. They want to know, can I afford this? They're not thinking 
the down the road, the interest rates, they're not everyone is. You and I are. Right. Probably everyone on who's here live, but people watching might not. They want that instant gratification and they're not thinking of the ramifications that come, the consequences of having high interest rates. Um, if you had something else to add on that topic, I have two more questions. So I didn't mean to no, interrupt, no, but there, there are people that don't really look at every factor. Mm -mm, no, they don't. So I'm just one of these, you have buyers beware, even though it's for federal <laughs> loans. Honestly, make sure you understand first. If not, then I'm always here when judgment day comes and you have to start paying. Judgment day. Yes. Well, <laughs> speaking of which, so I have, a, I have two questions that stood out. Okay. Number one, people might ask, what about my spouse's income? Does that get factored in in my loan? Absolutely. 100%. No. So the Department of Education changed the rules and regulations years ago. Even if you file a joint tax return, even if you have a joint bank account, you even if you have no income and your spouse has 200,000 in income it is a very simple question does your spouse want to contribute their income to the calculation of the student loan repayment amount if the spouse says no you simply explain to the department of education i do not have reasonable access to my spouse's income. It is one of the no. biggest mis... Yeah, I, I haven't had a spouse say yes yet. It is the biggest misconception that there is that you have to file a separate return. The Department of Education corrected that because it was discriminatory. That's very helpful. That's that's They get a clap for that, right? Give credit where credit is due. Yeah. Uh, so here's another question. What would you advise this individual to do? You meet an individual, they're making a nice income. Maybe they're making $100,000 a year. They have some old student loans, 50 grand. It's, it's been deferred for some time, right? So you hear people say, I'm in deferment. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Temporary, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then they have some inheritance that comes their way. And that will easily handle the entire $50,000 loan. What would you tell this person to do? Would you would you recommend let's go ahead and take fifty thousand from this hundred thousand dollar inheritance? This way, you're you're debt free. You you have nothing to worry about, um, and then you'll save or invest the other fifty. Um, or would you still tell them to try and figure out what's best, what's next for these loans before taking fifty grand and just giving it to this debt? So that's a really simple question because I just dealt with that with a friend who had a large inheritance. So the first thing I would say is you need to talk with your financial advisor to see if you invest that 50000 how much is it going to earn you each year? Now, will that money earn enough to cover the payments under the income driven and you still have your 50000 so I would never recommend anybody to do that because these loans get forgiven. Car, pay, car loans don't get forgiven. Mortgages don't get forgiven. No other debt gets forgiven. So under the program, unless your income is so high that you're going to pay off that loan and all of the additional interest, I would say no, park your 50,000, let it make money, take that money and make your student loan payment. And I just experienced this with a friend who had an inheritance, was gonna pay cash for a car. And I'm like, please don't do that. Here, talk to this advisor, take that money. Now she's using the money, the interest from her inheritance to make the car payment and she still has the lump sum, so. Unless somebody has exceptional wealth, I have a, a client, well, I don't have them as a client, is $300,000 in debt. His father is a major attorney and real estate investor in LA. 
And the father looked at me and said, I can pay off these loans the same way you can buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Right? But I still won't. <laughs> Not me. And I said, sir, everybody has to do what they feel is best for them. I'll go buy my Starbucks, you know, and keep my money. So there are some people that the program, and there's some people the program won't work for because it won't lower their payment based on high, high income. But even somebody making 250000 with a $3,000 a month student loan payment, the program's going to help them. Making three hundred and fifty thousand and making a three thousand dollar month payment still a strain. At least I think so. And in California, if you're making a hundred thousand and you're in Podunk, Iowa, making a hundred thousand, no offense to people in Podunk, um, your money goes a lot further than it does in California. So high income does not always mean the program will not work. Right. That's a common misconception. And I love, you know, there are people that are just allergic to having debt. So when they find money, they're just like, I'm going to put that in there. Right. What if an adult wants to go back to school? The program is irrelevant. The loans go on hold. They go to school and they go directly back into the program when they graduate. Wow. Now You don't earn forgiveness during that time, but you don't owe a payment. And except for, again, this historic time with COVID, student loans always are an interest. They're always accruing interest. You know, people think, oh, I'm just kicking the can down the road, but it's, you're kicking the can that's collecting a lot of things along the way. Um, Yeah, your soup can's going to turn into a garbage can by the time (laughs) you're ready. And it's going to stop you from from going much further eventually. I, I, I tell everybody, you know, these programs are the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the train coming at you. Wow. And, and can you are, can you try and negotiate the interest rates to get them lower? Student loan interest is set by Congress, right? Even if you consolidate your loans, it does not affect the interest rate. They use a weighted formula. There is no such thing as negotiating a federal student loan. You cannot lower the interest. That's for private student loan debt. And again, there is maybe one in 100,000 circumstances where you should take your federal loans private. And it's usually on smaller debt. Right. You know. Is there a minimum that you help people with? We start at 10,000. The more the debt, the higher the payment, the more we can help. Um, or if you are in default, it doesn't matter how what your loan amount is. Or if you are in public service, set up a conversation so we can make sure you're getting those credits. You're not guaranteed those credits unless you do the work with the Department of Education to get them. So a lot of people think that, oh, I've been working 15 years. Really? Your loans would have been forgiven five years ago if, you know, things were done correctly. So let's have a talk. Well, Mm -hmm. thank you so much, Brenda. This was so valuable. I know I'm constantly learning from, you you know, these, these rules. And I'll probably ask you a lot more questions when we help more people together. But I love it. You're the expert. So thank you for today. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people press replay on these on these talks and join us next week. You have you're in for a treat because we have our very own producer here. Rabbi Kevin Bemmel is going to be our um, guest. And the topic that we're going to talk about is what do you do when life throws a curveball? Life happens. Things surprises. Right. Whether it's the passing of a loved one, whether it's going through a divorce, whether it's a loss of a job, a change of a job, something happens. And how do we prepare? So a couple of things we're going to talk about. How do we prepare before, during, after? How do we rebound? How do we come above, right? How do we rise above it? What are some of the necessary steps that we can take when it comes to things that are unseen and um, being really prepared? So I'm excited to have that. Tune in, let people that you care about know about the show next Thursday, one o'clock Pacific time. 
I want to thank you all. Have a phenomenal rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.